Our scripture today comes from Ezekiel chapter 33, starting at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, when I bring the sword against the land and the people of the land, choose one of their men and make him their watchman. And he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people. Then if anyone hears the trumpet, but does not heed the warning, and the sword comes and takes his life, their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, the sword comes and takes someone's life. That person's life will be taken because of their sin, but I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sin and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their, sin, their ways, and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, but you yourself will be saved. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O people of Israel? Is the word of God for the people of God. Have any of you ever read the book of Ezekiel? When you read Ezekiel, one of the things you notice is, is there's some wild things in there. There's strange visions starting as early as chapter 1. Ezekiel's out in the wilderness, and he sees this vision of living creatures and lights, flashing lights, and, and wheels within wheels, and it's a vision of God. Or we go on to chapter 37, and we see Ezekiel have a vision of dry bones and the bones are so dry, there's no life left in them. But, but God speaks, God sends his spirit, God breathes on them, and the bones come together and live again. Or in chapters 38 and 39, we see his prophecy against Gog and Magog, and has this vision of these mighty armies coming against God's people. And we get to chapter 47, and we see Ezekiel's vision of the temple, the temple on the mount there in Jerusalem. But instead of just sitting there, there's a river flowing out of it, the river of the Spirit of God, the life of God, flowing to the life of people. It's wild visions. There's also other kinds of strange things. In Ezekiel 24, starting at verse 15, we read this. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, with one blow I'm about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your mustache and beard or eat the customary food of mourners. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I was commanded. Strange stuff in the book of Ezekiel. But as you read Ezekiel, there's a refrain that happens over and over and over again about 60 times. You can't miss it. Over and over again, God says, I am doing this. This will happen so that you will know that I am the Lord. So that you will know. This sounds like knowledge. If they know it, if they know he's the Lord, what will they do with that knowledge that they have? Will their knowing lead to acting? Consider our text today, Ezekiel 33. This story of Ezekiel being appointed as a watchman 
is so important that we get the story twice. We get it back in chapter 3, and then it's repeated almost verbatim here in chapter 33. I first encountered this story when I was in high school. It's my senior year, and our youth group was, was doing a 30-hour famine. Anybody here ever done a 30-hour famine? Yeah, some of you know what it's like. What you do is you go 30 hours without eating to get some teeny tiny idea of what it is to be hungry. And you raise money at that time for World Vision to send money off to help people who are hungry around the world. Well, in, in our 30 hours, we did a lock-in, and I remember watching a movie. I have no clue, have no recollection what movie it was. But this passage featured in that movie, and it stuck with me ever since. And after my senior year, I went off to college. And I went to college as an intentional Christian, not just somebody who had been a church member, not just somebody who had been in a youth group, but I went to college with the intention of being a Christian on campus, of actively seeking God, of actively seeking to be of use to God in achieving His purposes. In, in my life as a Christian, I've only had two visions. And my visions weren't, weren't as strange as Ezekiel's. The first vision I had when I was a college student. I don't remember exactly when it happened, except that it was after dinner. And the dorm that I was living in had, had dorms, and then there was an open area, an open air atrium. And after dinner, sometimes the guys lived in the dorm would just gather there on the railings and holler at each other and talk to each other and visit. And I was there one night, and I had a vision. And it was just maybe two or three seconds, very short vision. But what I saw was a lot of those guys in hell. And it broke my heart. It wasn't the hell that we think of in the movies or the cartoons, flames. It, it was just utter aloneness, utter isolation. I could see them together, but, but my sense of them was they were utterly alone. I get this passage in Ezekiel. The idea in the background of this text, this watching out for people, has a New Testament variant which also shaped my call. Starting at 1 Corinthians 9, verse 13, Paul writes, Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? And that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the temple? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights, for I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me, for I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. Then this next verse is the one that I can't let go of. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Every now and then over the years, I've had occasion to do uh, career nights at high schools. Still waiting for somebody here to invite me to do a, a career night here. Talk about the career of being a pastor. And one of the things I, I share with people when they come and stop by is a quote from Spurgeon. C.H. Spurgeon was a British preacher in the 19th century. Spurgeon said, if there's anything else you can do, don't preach. Now, he's talking there about it as a profession. He's not talking about it as the responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus to act on what we know. What's the watchman know here in Ezekiel? He knows that God is appointing him as a watchman. God is saying, pay attention. Look at what's going on. The watchman knows that he has a message, that judgment is coming. 
The watchman knows that some people will like that message. Some people will share it with their neighbors. Some will get on the Internet. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not then, but now they'll, they'll share it on the Internet. Some will hear it as if the preacher is singing pretty songs. We read it at the end of the chapter here, the end of Ezekiel 33, starting at verse 30. As for you, son of man, your people are talking about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, saying to each other, come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. My people come to you as they usually do and set before you to hear your words. But they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love. Their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. For they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. Can you imagine if you're Ezekiel and you hear this? Ezekiel, your job is to be a watchman. Your job is to put your life in the line for your people, to announce the coming judgment, to announce what I'm about to do. But Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you. We see here in 33 that the message of God here is for God's people. Judgment is coming on God's people. It's not to outsiders. It's not on the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Persians or the Medes or the Greeks or the Romans. It's God's people. But we also see there's shared responsibility here. The watchman, watchman's job is to pay attention. The watchman's job is to see the danger. The watchman's job is to tell the people. But the people have the responsibility to heed the warning. And I see here finally that all of this is driven by God's passion for the people. Do you hear that in, in verse 11? Where God says, surely, I take, sh- surely as, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? God is passionate for his people. As we go to the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, we see in chapter 1 how God has at various times, various ways, spoken to the prophets, but now... In these last days, he's spoken through a son. In Jesus, God has done more than just speak words out. God has done more than just give information. He sent Jesus to come all the way to us as one of us, going all the way to the cross. We see this same passion in Jesus' story of the lost sheep. The shepherd, like the watchman, had a job. The shepherd, like the watchman, knew the consequences of being a lost sheep. The shepherd has to keep an eye out, watching for sheep. He had to count them over and over again to make sure they're all there. Now, of course, unlike people, sheep lacked the capacity to think clearly about such things. The sheep weren't thinking, oh, if I get lost, I'm in trouble. And in Jesus' telling of the story, we see that the shepherd searching at the lost sheep had a hundred. He didn't reckon that having 99% of his sheep was good enough. But he sought out that one because of love. And Ezekiel watching out for the people is the prophet's job. In 1 Corinthians 9, watching out for the people is Paul's job. But the logic of both makes it not just their job. Consider again Ezekiel's refrain. Do we know who the Lord is? Do we know who God is? Do we know what he's done? Do we have adequate information? Have we experienced Jesus? If all that is the case, then we, regardless of our title, whether we have any title in church at all, regardless of our age, however young we might be, however old we might be, 
We each have a responsibility to watch out for the people around us. Ezekiel watched for judgment coming. They needed to know when the threat was coming because the judgment of God was real. God held his people to account. We watch out for what God has done in Christ. Instead of danger primarily, we point to the opportunity. Not just that there is no danger, but that Jesus is for people. Jesus is for sinners. So what can we do? Oh, first thing is pay attention. Have any ever have you ever been to a T-ball game? T-ball, I don't know if it's fun to play. I didn't play it as a kid. I don't know if they had it when I was a kid, but it's fun to watch, isn't it? And it's fun to watch not because it's great baseball. It's fun to watch because the kids are out there, and, and you see them playing in the dirt or picking flowers or, or following the ants. Well, the ball just goes right by. Distracted by everything that comes along. Are we like that as Christians? Distracted from the call of God, distracted from the message of God, distracted from the people around us by everything that happens. Are we acting like spectators in the stands, thinking our job is maybe to be entertained by those out on the field or those doing the work? Or worse, thinking our job is to sit back and criticize. Hey, kid, quit playing in the dirt. Or we're watching a football game. Coach, why did you make that call? Don't you know any better? I could do better than you. Or quarterback, why would you throw that interception? I'd be better than you. I think of the story told about William Booth, who with his wife Catherine founded the Salvation Army. He started off as a Methodist preacher in the mid-19th century in England. One reason that they separated from the Methodists is that his wife Catherine was also called to preach. And the Methodists didn't want anything to do with that. Another factor was that in that time, the Methodists had gone mainstream. They'd become respectable, and they valued being respectable. And yet, as William Booth looked around, he saw thousands upon thousands of unreached people in the cities of the country. The Booths felt called to do something about it. The story's told of a time when one of the respectable church ladies came up to William Booth and said, Sir, I don't care for your method of doing evangelism. And William Booth's response was, Madam, I don't care for your way of not doing evangelism. As you see, what Booth was doing was following in the way of John Wesley. John Wesley, who just a little over 100 years before, had been invited to Bristol, Bristol England by George Whitfield. And Whitfield had said, John, the fields are ripe unto harvest, but you've got to go out in the fields. And Wesley was so entranced, so committed to respectability, couldn't imagine going out where the people were. You could only preach in church, in a consecrated church building. He had to do it the right way. But Wesley was so moved by his experience of Christ, so moved by the call of God, so moved by his love for people, that he says in his journal that he submitted to be more vile and went and preached outdoors. And as you read onward in John Wesley's journal over the next 45, 50 years, over and over again, he'll talk about going to a place and then how he delivered his soul from judgment. He's, he's looking at Ezekiel here about how the watchman is responsible. Wesley saw himself as the watchman for England. William Booth saw himself as a watchman. If we're going to do this, we've got to pay attention. We also have to pay attention to God, to what God has done, to what God is doing. And if we today presuppose that God isn't in the business of doing things today, we're missing something of immense importance. 
William Booth and his wife Catherine, they knew what God had done. They knew what God was up to there and then. And they had to respond. As watchmen, we also pray for God to deepen our love for people. We serve as watchmen. We watch out for people not because of our superiority, not because we're church members and they're not, not because we have our lives together and they don't. We serve as watchmen because we know who God is and we've received that reckless love for ourselves. And because we love people, we pay attention to them. We spend time with them. We engage with them. We allow our hearts to be broken for them. We look for signs of God's work in their lives, and we look for ways to join God's work in their lives. Today, do, do, are you willing to become the kind of people who are willing to watch out for others, to watch out for God's opportunities in their lives, to watch out for the warnings, to watch out for the dangers, to watch out for them and to offer them Christ? Are you willing to do that? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the deep love, the deep love you have for us. And I thank you that that deep love you have for us is not just for us, but is for all the people around us. Lord, break our hearts today for people so that we, like Ezekiel, will hear your call to watch out for them, to share your love with them, to bring them to Jesus. Amen.